So uh, our judges are just getting uh, organized with uh, Nick Weigel, but we'd like to welcome you. This is the final leg of this afternoon's uh, program. Of course, you've uh, heard of the famous Mitch Gala, which will be tonight at 6.30 at the Quality Coal Family Center. It was an absolutely wonderful time uh, last year. And I think uh, tonight will be just as much fun, if not more. And we have a great dinner time speaker, and we'll be giving out some awards and stuff. And it's just a great community uh, building, um, you know, celebration. Of course, Dr. Goodbear's den has been for the last three years. And um, uh, Dr. Goodbear will be introduced, but I just want to point out there were questions as to who is in. And I just want to point out that Dr. Goodbear is a real person, okay? You heard today that faith and believing in things is important. So you have to believe in Dr. Goodbear, okay? None of the cynicism, oh, it's just a person in a suit. This is a real person. Okay, that's just my sidebar. Um, so I did tell you that we had someone all the way from uh, Sweden. Dr. Uh, Jennifer Protiger is um, a former PhD. She graduated from the Manitoba Institute of Child Health, and she's been uh, doing her postdoctoral fellowship at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. And it was part of her brainchild that came up with uh, Dr. Goodbear's den three years ago. And um, the first year, she, you remember, she didn't have a voice. Last year, I think she just had a little one born, and uh, Dr. Brandy Wicklow had it. So she's back this year um, in person with a voice. Welcome back to Winnipeg. Thanks very much for the introduction. It is my pleasure to be here. Um, as uh, Dr. Clausen mentioned, I am uh, I trained in Winnipeg. I'm Winnipeg born and raised, and it's really, really nice to be home. Um, we have a wonderful program this afternoon. Um, thanks uh, to our trainees who submitted abstracts uh, for the abstract competition, many of the posters which you will have seen at lunchtime. The top abstracts um, from the Child Health Research Day comp competition will be presented this afternoon. And as I mentioned, all of these presenters are trainees. Um, each of the trainees um, submitted an abstract, and these have been grouped th uh, thematically into th three groups. And each of the trainees, when they file up on stage, will have a maximum of five minutes to speak about their work, but they're going to talk about the what, what they did. And then they're going to talk about the so what. What does this mean? What, what do, does this work mean going forward? And then the now what? How can we drive it forward even further? And what are the implications of the work and the relevance to child health and also to foreknowledge translation? Following each of the themes, there'll be a 10-minute question period, and the questions will be first received from our esteemed judges, and those judges are our keynote speakers. First, uh, Dr. Vanya Jones, uh, second, Dr. John Walker, and the third, uh, Dr. Carolyn Snyder. Um, and the, uh, the judges have been asked to uh, question the uh, presenters about their work, but specifically also about the knowledge translation of their work. And then uh, pending time, again, 10 minutes per thematic session, um, we'll take questions from the audience as well. And then the top presenters will be announced at the gala this evening. And the trainees, uh, or the presenters, uh, of course, have been told that they must be in attendance to receive their prizes. So that's an overview of the program this afternoon. And without further ado, I will call up the presenters uh, who are presenting on the first theme, which is lungs and the airways. Please. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Vidyana Nanaparthi, and I'm a PhD student with uh, Dr. Redvan Mogbel and Dr. Andrew Heleko. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous facing you guys, but please excuse me for that. So we heard a lot about asthma just before in our previous uh, presenters, Adrian mainly, that it's a chronic inflammatory syndrome, oh sorry, chronic inflammatory condition, and I can say it's syndrome, and it's of the lungs, and where the structural tissues surrounding the airway wall are severely modified. 
This disease affects at least 13% of Canadian children and is one of the leading causes of pediatric hospitalizations, which you guys, everybody know that. The children mainly end up in the emergency rooms primarily because of acute bronchospasms, also known as asthma attacks, and these are primarily mediated by exaggerated responses from airway smooth muscle tissue. And for this reason and many other number of uh, sort of various other reasons, it, this airway smooth muscle tissue, it offers a strategically novel treatment target. Uh, Airway smooth muscle pathophysiology is determined by a number of factors. These include cytokines, uh, chemokines, growth factors, and recently we are looking into neuromediators. Uh, primarily, our lab is looking into glutamate. This glutamate functions as a ligand for a calcium permeable ion channel complex known as NMDA receptors, and these receptors have very well been studied in neuroscience. So in our project, we hypothesize that glutamate exerts its biological effects in human airway smooth muscle cells uh, through NMDA receptors and contributes to airway smooth muscle functions. For most of our, uh, for all our experiments, we used the human airway smooth muscle as a, uh, a smooth muscle cell line to determine receptor subunit expression at the mRNA protein level. To determine the physiological functions, we used 2D collagen gel assays and also measured intracellular calcium mobilization using a real-time video microscopy system uh, with a ratiometric dye called FURA2. To, to begin with, NMDA receptors are multi-subunit complexes. And we can, uh, in airway smooth muscle cells, these cells express most of these subunits at the mRNA level, and the receptor expression we confirmed, uh, subunit expression we confirmed at the protein level by Western blot. Then we looked at the physiological relevance of these receptor expression using collagen gel assays that proceeded with human airway smooth muscle cells, and when the cells were stimulated with the specific ligand, receptor specific ligand, which is NMDA, there was contraction in these collagen gels, which suggests that stimulation of NMDA receptors induces contraction. And we were able to block these responses using a receptor antagonist, DAP5. In human airway smooth muscle cells, contraction is primarily mediated by calcium responses. And also considering the point that NMD receptors are calcium channels, uh, we looked at the calcium flux in these cells when stimulated with the specific agonist. And indeed, NMD receptor activation induces considerable calcium mobilization in these cells. Uh, and these responses, we were able to block them using the receptor antagonist. Using a calcium-free buffer system, we were also able to determine, um, uh, uh, we were also able to show that uh, the calcium responses that are mediated through NMDA receptor um, is that primarily these receptors uh, uh, mobilize extracellular calcium into intracellular spaces. To take this work further, we, uh, we next looked at the effect of a pro-inflammatory cytokine TNF uh, on uh, receptor expression and calcium mobilization. And we can see that when airway smooth muscle cells are treated with TNF, there is a time-dependent increase in NR1 subunit expression. And also, I can, uh, we have seen that TNF also regulates the expression of various other subunits. Next. We looked at the calcium mobilization patterns with TNF treatment and NMDS receptor stimulation does change the receptor, uh, the calcium mobilization pattern in airway smooth muscle cells. Also, it induces a significant change in the cells that, uh, in, the, in the ratio of responders to non-responders, where now more number of cells, they start responding to the agonist. However, we did not say any change in the peak calcium levels, which suggests that TNF changes the receptor subunit configuration altogether uh, in airway smooth muscle cells, and also there is a heterogeneous distribution of the receptor subunits in these cells. We want to further evaluate these responses using intact airways from urine and human lung slices and also look at the effect of the antagonist, whether we can uh, ameliorate these responses. Around 6 to 10 percent uh, uh, children, they suffer with poorly controlled asthma where they, these kids do not respond adequately to uh, what we say as current medications. So neuromediators and uh, it's time now, but I would like to say that neuromediators and the receptors, they offer a, a nice alternative in these kids. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Aruni Jha, a PhD student under Dr. Andrew Haleko. And first of all, I would like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to uh, present my stuff in front of you. So uh, basically, my today's talk will be based uh, differentiating the 
by differentiating the route of administration of Simvastat, you can change or you can better the effect, uh, system, uh, in vivo effect, uh, at least in the animal models. So uh, first of all, I would like to start with some uh, facts about asthma. Um, Asthma is a disease which mostly affects children, and in Canada, almost 16% of the children in the age group of 4 to 11 years are affected by asthma. And uh, despite having the controller medications, still the prevalence of asthma is uh, rising. And some of these children go on to develop the severe type of disease, uh, which is the major cause of hospitalization among the children and cause severe economic burden on uh, any society. So, my uh, goal is to evaluate statins in asthma, and uh, statins are basically a very well-tolerated cholesterol-lowering drug, and uh, there are tons of literature available that suggests the pleiotropic benefit of statins, which, is, uh, which can be summarized as antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects of statin, uh, because of which statins have been projected as potential therapeutic candidate for asthma. However, there are certain flawed clinical trials that has questioned the efficacy of statins in treating asthma. Our own previous work suggests that uh, when you give statins systemically to animals, it does blunt the uh, allergen-induced airway inflammation, but has no effect on hyperreactivity. The, and the part of the reason for uh, not having an impact on the airway hyperreactivity is when we did some pharmacokinetic assessment, we could not find any simvastatin in the lungs of these animals. Those were uh, administered simvastatins uh, systemically. So our objective was to change the route of dose from a systemic one to the inhaled uh, and to assess its impact on allergen-induced lung inflammation and decline in lung function with the hypothesis that inhaled simvastatin at very low dose will improve the uh, airway uh, inflammation and uh, hyperreactivity, or I can say improve the lung function as well. So in our experimental design, we basically challenged the mice with house dust mite. And uh, the animals that received the systemic simvastatin, they were delivered simvastatin through the subcutaneous route. So, and uh, here in the schematic, I have already highlighted uh, my treatment protocol. So basically, uh, mice received house dust mite for two weeks, five days per week. And then the other groups received uh, simvastatin systemically, uh, along with the house dust mite challenge, or in, through inhaled route, uh, along with house dust mite challenge. And we assessed lung inflammation, lung histology, and lung function. Uh, the highlight of the study here is the dose, the difference in dose of the simvastatin. As you can see, the systemic simvastatin was delivered at 40 milligrams per kilogram, which is reported in the literature, and the inhaled simvastatin was delivered at a dose of 6.25 micrograms per kilogram. And uh, as supporting our previous work, we found that simvastatin does inhibit the inf airway inflammation by reducing the eosinophils and neutrophils that you can see in the uh, graph. And it also blunts the house dust mite induced uh, goblet cell hyperplasia. Goblet cells are basically the chief mucus pr producing cells in the lungs. And as you can see, the SDM induced uh, goblet cell hyperplasia was literally blunted by simvastatin. However, now the fact comes that whatever therapy is intended to treat asthma should definitely improve the lung health. So we ex exposed these mice to uh, the small animal ventilator, and we evaluated the lung function in these mice in terms of airway resistance. And as you can see, the systemic simvastatin had no effect on the on the lung function. However, when we gave mice the simvastatin through intranasal route, as you can see, it completely abrogated the response of HDM. So we can conclude that simvastatin, when delivered through an inhaled route, suppresses the allergic airway inflammation and improves the lung function at a dose which is 6,000 times less than the systemic dose. So my next plan is to evaluate the benefit of simvastatin as adjunct therapy in asthma. And uh, definitely, uh, now, with these data, clinical trials for future can be refined to include children to target asthma with simvastatin. Thank you very much.
Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Oluwashan Ojo, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow under the supervision of Dr. Haleiko. So my talk is um, basically focusing on um, the, the possible effects of early onset smoking and lung disease. And just to start off with, I'll just highlight some of the statistics in terms of early onset smoking. But the one that really grabbed me was um, the, the, the stage at which um, um, 10 graders to 12 graders are beginning to smoke. This is quite alarming because the, the onset is now getting much, much uh, lower. And we know that smoking is related to lung disease, specifically COPD. So the angle for this project was to see how um, COPD um, patients who are ex-smokers um, um, elicit uh, the, the disease phenotype. So specifically, we used um, um, COPD lung fibroblasts, which are cells that are involved uh, in the structure of the airway. And what we looked at was the inflammatory phenotype of these cells from the COPD um, patient. Specifically, we looked at the inflammatory mediator called TSLP, or thymic stromal lymphopoietin. And now this is an inflammatory mediator that's released by inflammatory cells as well as cells that, li that line the, the airways. And what's important about this is there's, a, there's already a known link to TSL, um, to to lung disease, specifically in the tissues of um, ex-smokers with COPD. Um, in terms of the, the element of smoking, uh, we know that um, cigarette smoke can also induce it in other cell types as well, for example, smooth muscle cells. So to this end, we had two main specific objectives to, to try and identify what TLCLP does. One was to in investigate the phenotype of lung fibroblasts from ex-smokers with COPD using TLCLP as an output. And secondly was to look at targets that may be pro promoting this phenotype response. So moving forward, the hypothesis was human COPD lung fibroblasts elicit an impaired or altered inflammatory phenotype in response to cytokine stimuli. So what methods did we use? So, so first of all, the First of all, okay, first of all, the, the, the donors we used, so we had non-COPDs as well as COPD donors. And um, specifically for this, the COPD donors were actually moderate COPD. And it's important to highlight that both COPD and non-COPD were ex-smokers. So we normalized for smoking. And basically, we used tissues we get um, from lung resections. And using a range of techniques, we were able to look at functional outputs that may um, try and answer the question in terms of the inflammatory phenotype. So one of the first things we did was to do an ELISA, just measuring the amount of TSLP in the COPD and non-COPD fibroblast. And as you can see here, oh, that's not working. So as you can see here, um, comparing the basal levels between COPD and non-COPD, TLCLP is increased. The y-axis is just showing the amount of TLCLP normalized to cells. And when you treat with TNF-alpha, TNF-alpha is important here because we know cigarette smoke can also induce TNF-alpha in the context of disease. And this is also increased as well. We then wanted to ask the question, is this driven by the transcription, transcriptional um, event? So using a TSLP reporter assay that basically uh, allows us to know whether it's a transcription activation process, we looked at TSLP luminescence. And again, as you can see here, um, both basally and with TNF-alpha treatment, you get uh, basically a mimicking of the response we see with release, thereby tying the, the protein release with transcriptional activity. We then went on to look at further downstream signaling. So first of all, what we then did was to ask the question, is there a receptor difference between COPD and non-COPD? And there wasn't any difference. So we looked at um, intracellular signaling downstream. And the take home message here is that looking at uh, MAP kinase signalings, P38 and ERK, there is a difference in, in the COPD compared to the non-COPD fibroblasts. Now this was all well and good. So, we have simvastatin project in our lab. So what we then did was to use simvastatin to see if we can inhibit this, this effect, and simvastatin didn't do this. Now, it's interesting that smoking is also linked to epigenetic effects. So we then looked at the sensitivity of the COPD um, donors in terms of epigenetics. So we used a, a pharmacological compound called JQ1, which basically inhibits the effect of bromodomains and therefore prevents them from binding to acetylysins. And what we saw was a normalization of the, of the TSL re response when cells were treated with JQ1. 
So in summary, we saw increased TLCLP driven by promoter activity and increased um, um, signaling as well as epigenetic mechanisms. So the future work that I would like to do is basically look at the chronic obstructive arm in comparing non-smokers and smokers and also see what relation TSOP has in terms of the, the overarm of COPD. So moving forward, in terms of the relevance, what would be good would be to look at markers that, that can basically be effective in, in the patients with COPD. And just lastly, it's just this, this, this video here that just draws on the point about the importance of COPD Every in terms of maternal expo um, ex um, exposure and its effects long term. Every step you take. Breathlessness can be an early sign of COPD, a lung disease mainly caused by smoking. Make sure every breath you take is smoke-free by quitting today. Every... Thank you. Everybody, my name is Nagme Khoshku. I'm a PhD student in Dr. Richard Kaiser lab. In our lab, we are working on the congenital diaphragmatic hernia, a developmental disease in the diaphragm. As you can see, in, in this uh, developmental defect, the, um, um, the abdominal organ herniate to the uh, thorax, and uh, um, um, a newborn baby with this disease, uh, because of this herniation and uh, because of the lung uh, uh, hypoplasia, uh, they have the uh, uh, hypertension and hypoplasia in their lung. And because there isn't any uh, uh, mutation for uh, this disease, we are working on the role of epigenetic factor in that. And we know that microRNA is one of the important epigenetic factor, uh, which uh, we know that microRNA uh, is a small RNA that can um, regulate the um, uh, transcription at the, uh, and uh, uh, inhibit the transcription of the um, specific M mRNA and uh, uh, just uh, regulate the gene expression post-transcriptionally. We showed before that MIR200B is one of these microRNA that is significantly decreased in our uh, model of CDH in early um, lung development. If you go to the uh, uh, literature, we see that MIR200B can uh, target the process that is called epithelial mesenchymal transition in the cancer cells. Through this process, uh, epithelial cells ch change to mesenchymal cells to invade to another organ. Based on this information, we want uh, to know to determine the role of MIR200B in epithelial mesenchymal transition and CDH model to somehow uh, um, answer the uh, um, and um, explain why we have uh, we see uh, more mesenchymal thickness in our congenital diaphragmatic hernia uh, patient. So we use nitrofen rat model. Uh, nitrofen is a herbicide, but it can cause a CDH in the rat uh, fetus. Uh, that is very, very similar uh, to the human patient. Uh, and for that, we use a different technique, scratch assay, western blood, and immunohistochemistry to obtain and to get to our objective. First of all, we wanted to see how MIR200B can affect the uh, lung cell migration. And, we, and for reaching to that, we use a scratch assay. Human bronchial epithelial cells grow to the um, uh, confluence. And as you can see, uh, we, we, um, we made an identical uh, scratch in different group. And then after 16 hours, the, as you can see here, the cells that are transfected with MIR200B inhibitor had much more uh, rate of uh, migration than the control. So it can show us that 200B, loss of MIR200B can increase lung cell migration, one of the important characteristics of the um, EMT process. Then we wanted to look at different uh, marker of the epithelial mesenchymal transition. And there is two uh, important marker. One of them is a TGF beta or SMAT signaling. And uh, the other one is a ZDV2, which is a transcription factor for EMT. So 
We use le um, Western blood and hu uh, on human bronchial epithelial cells. As you can see here, we found that when we uh, treated the cells with the nitrophen, or when we uh, transfect the cell with MIR200B inhibitor, we have more expression, more activation of the uh, signaling. And interestingly, when we add more MIR200B in the cells that are uh, treated with nitrophen, we have uh, uh, less, uh, we, we can reduce the expression and activation of the signaling. And we saw the same trend in our um, ZDB2 expression. So altogether, we can see, uh, we can um, suggest that nitrophen can inhibit MIR200B expression, which can promote uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition through smart signaling and more expression of the ZDB2. And it can probably uh, uh, explain the mesenchymal thickness that we are seeing in our model. And also, we already uh, generate the knockout mice for MIR200B, and we are going to look at the, uh, the real effect of the MIR200B in normal and abnormal development. And we, we believe that it can help us to uh, cure prenatal and postnatal pulmonary disease. Thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Min, and I'm from, doc I'm a master's student in Dr. Lake's lab. So um, I have a bad news for you, uh, and it's, it's one of the stories that just come, came out recently, is about a chemical called BPA that's been banned from our formula, formula containers and from a bottle. And it's bad news for me because when I was growing up as a child, I probably sucked on one of these, and here I am, I might be predisposed to asthma, and now it's banned. But the, the reason why I'm telling you this story is because, because it, it, this kind of story kind of emphasizes the importance of kind of monitoring what, what, uh, what kind of man-made chemical there are in, the, in, in our environment. And my project kind of studies that one another chemical that's, that's very similar to BPA. And it's called perforated compounds. Well, just like BPA, it's everywhere in our life. In Scotch guards, that you spray to protect your garments, or in your frying pan that you cook your eggs with, or in your new carpet that can, that can be there so that when you're breathing in your air at home, you could be bringing it in. Or if you have a toddler, they could be crawling in, in them. But point here is that it's everywhere. And they're persistent, meaning that they really don't break down in the environment. Or they, nor do they break down easily in the body so they actually bioaccumulate in the body so that I can guarantee you that everyone in this audience have, have them detectable level in their body and blood. And most importantly, you're exposed to these very early on from Zucker or from even starting in your mother's womb. That's why I wanted to study this chemical and to see the effect of this chemical on, um, on our lung. And the two chemicals, it's this most prominently found chemicals, that are PFCs, in the environment. And this one is called PFOA, perforal octanoic acid. This is a solid form, and or 8,2-fluorochilomal alcohol, or FTOH, which I'll be referring from now on. So to, uh, to, to, to tell you about my uh, research project, I started with a hypothesis that in utero through postnatal exposure of mice to PFOA or FTOH impact basal and allergic lung inflammation and function. To do that, I um, employed a mouse model uh, um, and studied the effect. And I started exposure uniquely because in, an in utero, all the other studies prior to this have kind of focused on an adulthood and exposure, but my, my mice started in, uh, in utero. The reason why, was, why I did that was because, um, because in utero, that's when the lungs are developing and having any impact during the, that critical time where the lung is important, the chemical probably and must have an impact if it does at all and that will carry on. So mice were fed with PFOA in diet or were breathing in FTOH through uh, house, being housed with contaminated huts with FTOH. And, and they were kept 
the moms were exposed, and the babies were exposed, and the babies continued in that environment or fed on the same diet. And eight to ten weeks, because we wanted to look at the allergic inflammation and function and the chemicals impact on them, we sensitized and challenged the mice um, with ovavimin, which is well-defined allergen that looks at the inflammation. So at 10 weeks, we measured several parameters, but today I would like to tell you a little bit about what I found in terms of respiratory function. Okay. Um, so in terms of when, when I measured in, uh, respiratory function, we measured it by using a flex event, what is a small animal ventilator. And what we did is we anesthetized the mice and looked at how their lung function against different uh, pressures or different agonists. So what I first found was that the baseline, this is normal breathing uh, kind of mimicked in, uh, um, in a ventilator. And what you found was that actually when they are normally breathing, they, the lung parameters were not altered. However, a disease like asthma, it's, uh, it's when you have an asthma attack that's important or how easy it is to trigger that asthma attack. And so we looked at... Um, the, the airway's response to methacholine, which is a well-known agonist. And from here, um, here what you see is a methacholine dose response curve. And the dotted line is the, what you see in a naive mouse. And what you saw was a well-defined uh, increase in resistance. But when you, gave, when you expose the mice to these chemicals, what, what happened was their airway, uh, they developed airway hyperresponsiveness, meaning that their, their airway actually got more tissue and that therefore, and then when they contract, they contracted much higher. However, that did not further augment the allergic um, AHR. Um, so what does this mean? That exposure to mice PFOF TOH might induce AHR equivalent to the observed in allergen challenged mice. And this has, I think, a complex uh, implication to the child health because, we, because given this um, finding in the animal model, we should uh, we should limit our exposure via greater public awareness and perhaps start another BPA project or awareness program. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our five presenters in the first theme. That uh, was a, a terrific kickoff to the Dr. Goodbear's Den. I, at this time, uh, would like to begin the 10-minute question period, and I would ask first, or I'd open the floor first to our esteemed judges, please. Dr. Snyder. Do you want us to stand or just ask? You can just ask. Okay. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all of you as a, uh, well, as a non-molecular um, biologist type, uh, the fact that I was able to understand pretty much what everybody was saying was, was very exciting, and, and so thank you for translating it so well. Um, I want to start, uh, I have questions for all of you, but probably don't have time, so I'm going to start with uh, uh, Aruni Jha. Um, as a physician, that excites me a lot, and we obviously see a lot of kids, as, as all of you know, with asthma in the emergency departments. Um, how are you going to approach taking your, your, your project to the next step, and who are you going to include on your team to make sure that the way you approach that is, is relevant and feasible? Okay, yeah. That was a kind of question I was expecting, actually. Oh, very so, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, uh, well um, to answer that, uh, as I as I um, explained, just speak loudly if it doesn't. Work. So, uh, as I as I, uh, as I put in my slide as well for my future goal, um, well, I have a base, um, base to, uh, to launch this project from here to uh, um, like in vivo as well as uh, into clinical settings. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely um, um, getting collaborations uh, into the clinics as well and taking this uh, particular medication uh, to the clinics um, is my ultimate goal. But before that, I think uh, the first challenge will be to make uh, simvastatin formulated into an inhaled dose, doses form so that human beings can take it because the way we just administer to animals in, uh, by dissolving it in saline is not going to work in the in the human being. So, uh, so for this, we need somebody uh, of uh, a pharmaceutical scientist 
who can formulate dose and then take it to the clinics with the help of clinicians to uh, start the clinical trials. Uh, but I would definitely like to take only the inhaled statin into the clinical trial, not the sim uh, systemic statin. So we can continue on, and I can ask you the question that really came up for me. Um, I think that, you know, asthma is such a big issue when it comes to children, especially urban children with some of the, um, and a lot of you addressed asthma. Um, the um, amount of asthma that you, so I'm assuming this person would take this, like the routine for taking this would be as a preventive measure? Is that what I understood? Uh, right now, yes. Uh, what I've tested in animals is for the preventive measure, but uh, I have plans where uh, I'm going to test this in animals. Uh, that will be along uh, chronic preclinical studies where uh, I would be estimating if statins can cure the, uh, cure the <laughs> if, if statins can cure the already established conditions like asthma, in, at least in animals first, and then I would like to take that thing to the clinic. So how much has. of acute, so you're hoping to um, reverse asthma as opposed to dealing with acute responses yeah. for asthma. Mm -hmm. oh, so you think you could eradicate all asthma by doing this? Uh, well, right now I don't know, but I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Do we change authors or can we, yeah? Okay, good. Uh, I want to comment on the presentation. Uh, first of all, all of them were terrific. I want to uh, maybe comment and ask a question for uh, Nagme. Okay. First of all, congratulations on the best photo there of, uh, of the anatomical changes. That was just great and really clearly gave him the message about that. So that was very well done. Um, most people, when they're doing research, run into some unexpected obstacles, something that doesn't go the way you want or, or that kind of thing. So in doing your research, did you run into any challenges like that, something that you had planned and you had to overcome an obstacle to keep the research moving? Yes, exactly. So uh, the most important thing for me, for the group, was that so the, there is a uh, uh, we are seeing that the decrease of, of the expression of 200 B in the first stage, and then in the la later stage, before the birth, we saw the higher expression in CDH. And it was the very challenging part for us, and we saw the same uh, things in the human tissue that we have, the same effect when it's in the we didn't have any tissue from the first stage, but in the last stage, we have the neonatal patient that have the increase in expression. And it was something that we didn't expect in the first, in the first place. But then uh, we did an, another project. Uh, one of my colleagues started to do another project on the uh, 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 trachea fluid of the patient with CDH. And then, at that time, we saw the same thing that we saw the overexpression of the uh, uh, 200B, but this time in the patient only that can survive. Not the patient that are not survived, they have a very low expression, the other have the high expression. And then we go back to our model, and when we look at uh, in the later stage, and then we found that the person, the, the rats that are, are very, very, have a very, very severe CDH, they have very low expression, and then the, the ones that have the hypoplastic, but mild hypoplastic, we have a higher expression. So it was, for me, it was the most exciting part and most challenging part. Thank you very much. So Min, uh, uh, I think all of us quickly identified with your, your work, given we're all familiar with the BPA, mm -hmm. and uh, I liked how you brought that in to make it so relevant to all of us. Uh, my next question is, um, with the PFCs, mm -hmm. uh, how do you take it the next step in terms of uh, studying it so that it if, in fact, you replicate what you've done in mice, do you replicate in children or people before you send it out to the world and say, stop using this and stop using PFCs? Or, or what stage is it okay to start saying it's time to make change in our environment? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. And um, 
yes, we can. Of, of course, you can test them and try to do it in human. Um, and I think, I think we have to go back to the BPA case where um, what they did was they found these results in animals starting with rodent and then they moved into primates okay. and then they could have re replicated in primates thinking that there, there was a very similar, sim very good similarities and then they actually overlapped that with the um, epidemiological studies um, that actually indicated the co um, that correlated, uh, uh, correlated between the exposure and as asthma development. So I think if there's a strong evidence from at that point, so taking both epidemiological as well as animal study, then we can probably very well con conclude that this is well we can stop it and with uh, uh, stop and promote. And actually with the BPA story, what's interesting is actually they actually never, FDA never said it, it was bad for you. No. Um, they didn't ban it on the premise of um, studies, rather Everyone uh, in the industry actually they volunte voluntarily withdrew it. I mean because this, here is a PR issues and then that's very um, <clears throat> nice to not have it in there in their product. So I think this this can be uh, translated into a everyday life by still taking a similar approach as BPA, um, and you can go from there. Um, I, I want to follow up on that because one of the questions that I had um, mm -hmm. was. If uh, these chemicals are so pervasive already, mm -hmm. and not everyone has asthma who has mm -hmm. it in their system, mm -hmm. what do you think is the difference between people who have it in their system and don't have an expression of asthma, mm -hmm. and people who do? Because clearly, that's something that needs to be considered for your research if you're going to move it forward. Yes. So, what do you think that is? Um. <laughs> well, hey, you my, did the research. I'm yes. just asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think, I mean, these are complex diseases and it's very hard to understand and we have to appreciate the complexity. And that from a scientific point of view, it's a very interesting case because some develop and some don't. And if I had to speculate, then it would be in uh, changes in, um, not in our gene, but how our genes are regulated. But other people have... Um, referred to as epigenetic factors, that perhaps with a longer exposure, it does change the way your genes are being read or are being translated or are being put into phenotypical changes that you see is, as an asthma. So from a scientific point of view, it's, it would be very interesting for me to really you know, dig into what are the changes in the molecular mechanism that has been changed. I don't know where exactly <laughs> to start because there's literally a thousand places to look, but. And that's where I um, really go into a look at the literature and what other people have found so far that quite relates to asthma and other diseases as well. Um, can I ask one question? Um, sorry, I don't want to. Um, Sean. <laughs> um, so you mentioned your population, your sample, were former smokers, and you spent a lot of time setting us up about the issue of being in an environment where smoke was present. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the sample that you have? Were they long-term former smokers, and that's, does that matter to the findings that you then um, had as a result of your research? Well, in terms of the, so that's a good question. In terms of the samples, <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the, the, the samples, the COPDs and non-COPDs, they actually had an, an average, um, what we refer to as packet years, so the number of, um, of cigarettes they smoke over a certain number of years. On average, was about 20 to 25 okay. in, both, in, both, um, in both sort of cohorts. Um, but the interesting thing is why those with COPD end up getting the disease, and those that are classed as non-COPD do not get the disease. But yeah, the, the duration of smoking um, may have an impact, definitely I think with, the, with those who end up getting COPD. But what is differentiating between both cohorts, it's something, it, that's the million dollar question. Okay. Um, I've got a question for uh, Vidya Anand. Um, I sort of had the same curiosity in doing your study, which was very interesting. Did you run into some obstacles along the way that you had to overcome or some challenges to complete the study and complete the research, or did it go smoothly the way you planned all the way through? Well, <clears throat> well as like in any study, every, uh, you'll have some challenges and you'll have some obstacles that you have to go through during the process of this program. 
Um, there have been quite a few eventful things, but uh, something, I mean, I was just thinking, like, what exactly is an obstacle that I encountered while getting my results, but I would like to say I have been pretty good, I have got pretty good mentors who were really supportive and I didn't really get any sort of major obstacles with, with my study. Okay. Good. Could you say a little bit more about what, what you see next in terms of the, the studies on that topic? Uh, the next thing is like whatever we did here, uh, whatever I showed in this in my slides is mostly an in vitro study. So the next objective what we have is to do, get into an ex vivo study where we are trying to get some, and we have been doing it. Uh, right now we have started with neuron uh, lung slices and we are looking at the responses in intact airways, uh, how these agonists respond, sorry, how these agonists regulate the responses in those airways. And, uh, and on top of it, like in the literature it is known that, uh, it has been published that most of the inflammatory cells and many of the structural cells, they release this glutamate into the microenvironment. However, there is a big issue which uh, there have been a couple of clinical trials done that monosodium glutamate, which is uh, Ajinomoto, which is we find in many of the Asian diets, there have been clinical studies done whether it uh, uh, aggravates asthmatic responsiveness. Uh, well, those studies interestingly have found nothing that it does something to it. But what I would like to say here is that in, even in our studies, what we've done, we have found in heterogeneity in terms of the receptor uh, expression. What does that heterogeneity mean? And whether these, the clinical trials that have been conducted, did they take into the account the heterogeneity in terms of the receptor, receptor expression and the responses? Um, I don't think so. They did take into account that heterogeneity. And we are targeting the population that is not uh, that is poorly controlled. Uh, I mean, patients who necessarily do not respond to the current medications, which means there is something different in these uh, individuals. So we are looking at what is that difference. This might be a starting step, and there have been many studies on uh, similar type of studies, I would like to say, on neuromediator, neuromediators and their receptors that are being done currently. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you to our first group of presenters. I'm sorry we didn't get time for questions from the audience, but uh, I'm sure that if any of you have burning questions and you approached our speakers uh, at the gala this evening, they'd be more than happy to attend to your questions. So our second theme is on diabetes, and I would invite the presenters for this theme. There are four of them up to the, uh, to the lectern. Good afternoon, my name is Caitlin Hogue. I'm a medical student working with Dr. Heather Dean. My project was to answer the question, is there an allele dose effect of the HNF1-alpha G319S polymorphism on clinical and biochemical phenotype of youth with type 2 diabetes at diagnosis? Oh, sorry. Our primary goal is to describe the clinical and biochemical variables associated with HNF1-alpha G319S polymorphism at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Our secondary goal was to document the changes in these features um, since the study done in 2000. Our hypothesis was that selected clinical and biochemical variables at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes are different between youth with the polymorphism and youth without the polymorphism. Okay. Hepatic nuclear factor 1A, or HNF1-alpha gene, codes for a transcription factor that is expressed in pancreatic beta cells and is involved in the insulin secretory pathway. A polymorphism in um, this gene can cause reduced insulin secretion, but the cell's glucose sensing functions should remain intact. Individuals with a substitution of serine for glycine at codon 319 are found to be at an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes and are said to have an accelerated age of onset by seven years per copy of the SLEL in adults. The Diabetes Education Resource Center, or Resource for Children and Adults or the Adolescents, sorry, the DERCA team studied the prevalence of the HNF1-alpha G319S polymorphism 
in 51 youth in 2000 and found that the polymorphism had less features, or individuals with the polymorphism had less features of insulin resistance, had lower BMI, and had higher hemoglobin A1C at the time of the study. We extracted demographic and clinical data for, um, from the DERCA database for children with type 2 diabetes that were self-declared aboriginal um, from age 0 to 18 years since 1985, and we excluded those who had not had HNF1-alpha G319S testing, um, as well as those who participated in the study in 2000. We included 317 youth in our study and looked at their age, gender, BMI Z score, hemoglobin A1C, liver enzy enzymes AST and ALT, urine albumin creatinine ratio or ACR, and diabetes specific antibodies. The distribution of HNF1 alpha G319S genotypes in our study was 48% wild type, 39% heterozygote, and 13% homozygote. And it was similar to those found in 2000. The differences in percentage of genotypes were not different between males and females. Overall, this population was diagnosed at a mean age of 12 and a half. We found that homozygous youth were diagnosed significantly younger at 11 and a half when compared to wild type youth who were diagnosed at an average age of 12.8 years. Mean BMI Z score in our overall population was 1.9, indicating that the majority of these youth are obese. We found that homozygous youth were leaner at diagnosis with a BMI Z score of 1.6 when compared to their wild type counterparts with a BMI Z score of 2.0. These results suggest that less obesity and insulin resistance is required to develop type 2 diabetes in these youth. Differences in percentage of youth with high ALT values greater than 90 or three times the upper limit of normal was significantly different between the homozygous youth and wild type youth. With 11% of homozygous youth having an ALT value that was high at diagnosis when compared to 19% of wild type youth. Higher ALT in the wild type group may be related to their higher BMI since obesity is associated with elevated liver enzymes. Mean albumin creatinine ratio was not different between the three groups statistically, but there was a trend towards increased levels of microalbuminuria in wild type and heterozygous youth. Obesity is also associated with elevated ACR and kidney damage, which could explain this trend. Mean hemoglobin A1C was not statistically different between the three groups, suggesting that the duration of disease prior to diagnosis and amount of beta cell failure is not different between youth with one or two copies of this allele. In conclusion, we found that homozygous youth in this population are younger and leaner at diagnosis with lower rates of comorbidities of obesity. Although current routine treatment guidelines are not different for homozygous youth, their results may inform new screening and treatment protocols, as well as inform youth and families about their risk of developing type 2 diabetes in future generations. There have been no new insights discovered to elucidate the role of HNF1-alpha G319S polymorphism in Aboriginal youth in Manitoba with type 2 diabetes. It's important to continue to make observations of clinical and biochemical features of these youth to inform future research directions and to assist in clinical decision making. The incidence of type 2 diabetes in children aged 0 to 18 years is increasing worldwide and the incidence in, is higher in Manitoba and northwestern Ontario than in any other region. Aboriginal children account for 44% of children with type, 1 di type 2 diabetes in Canada and the majority of these are in our region. Children with type 2 diabetes have a significantly increased risk for a variety of complications including kidney failure, severe and atypical infections, dyslipidemia, hypertension and elevated liver enzymes which is why research in this area with a focus on prevention and appropriate treatment is so important for child health. Thank you. I'm mildly amused at the fact that I'm giving a talk on blood pressure right now, being acutely aware of the level that mine is currently at. <laughs> Type 2 diabetes is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. The um, vascular consequences of type 2 diabetes increase with the age of the, per of the person as well as the duration of diabetes. This is of a special concern considering that the average age of an individual with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is decreasing. In addition, the number of children and adolescents being di diagnosed with type 2 diabetes is on the rise. The diagram on the right-hand side here shows that exercise systolic blood pressure can be a good predictor of cardiovascular events. This particular study out of Finland showed that those having the highest systolic blood pressure response to exercise had more than twice 
the occurrence of acute myocardial infarction compared to those having the lowest. Individuals with type 2 diabetes generally show an elevated response to exercise. This would indicate a risk for hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, none of this data has been collected on youth. Most of what we know to date is on those over the age of 50. We hypothesized that the hemodynamic responses to exercise would be exaggerated in youth with this glycemia compared to normal glycemic controls. To test this, we used a cross-sectional design involving adolescents aged 13 to 18 years. To be involved in the study, participants had to be willing and able to exercise, could not be on any corticosteroid me steroid medication, and could not have had substantial weight loss in the previous six months. We compared those with dysglycemia against a cohort of overweight, normoglycemic adolescents matched for age, height, weight, and sex. Both of these groups were then compared against healthy weight controls. The outcome of interest was the blood pressure response to exercise, which was measured manually, to a graded maximal cycle ergometer test to exhaustion. During the test, the resistance was increased by 30 watts every two minutes until the participant decided to quit. So the table on the left gives an idea of what our participants looked like. There were significant differences in many of the characteristics between the overweight, obese, and healthy weight groups, as well as between the dysglycemic and healthy weight group. However, there were no differences between the dysglycemic and overweight, obese groups, making them a good control. Our matching strategy worked quite well, with age, height, and weight being very closely matched between these two groups. The importance of these factors being matched uh, is noted due to the fact that they are the main predictors of blood pressure in this population. Blood pressure was measured manually every two minutes during the exercise test at three submaximal workloads, as well as at the end of the test at maximal effort. On the left, you can see the outcomes from the, cardio the uh, aerobic capacity side. The uh, top left over, let's see if this shows it here, there we go. VO2, um, which is the aerobic carrying capacity, a marker of fitness, uh, shows that the um, dysglycemic and overweight obese were very similar in terms of aerobic capacity, and that's the bottom line there, is actually overlapping and are lower compared to the healthy weight controls. These differences persisted even when expressing it in terms of fat-free mass, in spite of very similar heart rate responses. In terms of the blood pressure response, a trend towards higher systolic blood pressure was seen in both the overweight and the dysglycemic groups, with the differences being significant between the dysglycemic and healthy weight groups, both at baseline and at two minutes, which was 30 watts of resistance. Similarly, in the diastolic blood pressure group, uh, diastolic blood pressure readings, I should say, the dysglycemic group was showing higher values compared to the healthy weight controls, and a slight trend also existed for the obese individuals compared to the healthy weight controls. For the most part, there were no significant differences between the obese controls and the dysglycemic group. This shows us that the blood pressure responses to exercise are already elevated among overweight teens and not just those with type 2 diabetes or dysglycemia. It highlights the need for early prevention of obesity as the risk for hypertension and cardiovascular disease is already elevated in this group. Maximal exercise tests and submaximal ex sub exercise tests are minimally invasive and cost little to perform. These could potentially be used as a screening tool for hypertension risk in this population. We didn't see an elevated response in type 2 diabetes or in dysglycemic individuals to the extent that we were expecting to. This would be contrary to studies in adults and emphasizes the need for prospective studies to determine if blood pressure responses to exercise are actually a good predictor of incident hypertension and other cardiovascular outcomes in youth. And finally, there is a need for more mechanistic studies to determine the relative importance of age, diabetes duration, and exposure to hyperglycemia or obesity as determinants of the blood pressure response to exercise in order to determine appropriate areas for intervention. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Troy Pereira. I'm a master's student in Dr. Vern Dolinsky's lab. Uh, the talk I'll be giving today is gestational diabetes mellitus is predisposing rat offspring to early onset cardiac hypertrophy. So just to get into some background quickly, um, maternal obesity, hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, and impaired glucose tolerance contribute to gestational diabetes. It's a condition which affects uh, up to 5 to 10% of all pregnancies. There's clinical data that suggests 
Gestational diabetes may be detrimental to the development of the fetus, and it predisposes the offspring to developing metabolic orders later in life. Um, during the late, and pre, uh, late prenatal and early postnatal period of life, the growth of the heart switches from hyperplastic or proliferative growth to a hypertrophic growth, and therefore the regulation of cardiomyocyte size may be permanently programmed uh, during early life environment. So just getting into our experimental model quickly. Um, we're receiving our female Sprague Dolly rats at the age of three weeks old, and we randomly assign them to either a high fat and sucrose diet, which is a 45% kilocalorie uh, from fat diet, or a low fat uh, diet, which is a 10% kilocalorie from fat diet. And we leave them on these diets six weeks prior to breeding, and at the six week time point, we uh, measure to see if they're glucose intolerant, which is what we want to see in our high fat model to induce our gestational diabetes. Um, during uh, gestation, we're measuring glycemia at each trimester, and at birth, uh, we reduce our pups, uh, uh, our litters to eight pups each. With our excess pups, uh, we're taking uh, birth weight, birth size, uh, litter size, gender distribution. We're also dissecting for tissue weights, which is important for our heart studies. Um, after a period of weaning of three weeks with the mothers, uh, we then randomly assign each of the litters to either a low-fat or a high-fat diet, and follow them for a period of 12 weeks on the diet, doing a whole host of tests. So getting on to some of my results, these are our pregnant animal results. Um, and basically the take home message for this entire slide is that we've created a clinically relevant model to study uh, gestational diabetes and its effects on the offspring. Um, our animal models have shown that our mothers on our high fat and sucrose diets are obese compared to our lean controls. They're hyperglycemic during their pregnancy at mid gestation. They're more glucose intolerant than our lean control animals as well as they're hyperinsulinemic which are all characteristic of our gestational diabetic condition in humans. Moving on to some of our neonatal results, and these are our one-day-old animals. Um, we've noticed previously that we have uh, macrosomic fetuses. They are larger both in body weight and body length, so they're large for gestational age. And along with that, we've noticed that our overall heart weight, as well as our heart weight to body weight ratio, was significantly greater in our newborn neonates from our high-fat dams than from our controlled low-fat dams. And this is within 24 hours, so they're both significantly higher heart gross weights and significantly higher heart weight to body weight ratio. Moving on to our young adult, uh, young adult results, this is after our 12 week period of diet. And um, we noticed that our offspring from our gestational diabetic dams being fed a high fat diet postnatally had significantly higher triglyceride levels in the heart compared to our low fat offspring from our lean mothers. Um, we also noticed that the consumption, the postnatal consumption of our high fat and sucrose diets by our offspring from gestational diabetic mothers significantly increases the postnatal uh, heart weight to tibia length ratio compared to the offspring from our lean mothers. Um, we see an, uh, not a significant difference between heart, uh, heart gross weights between each of the dietary groups, but when we look at our heart weight to tibia length, which is a measure of true growth, uh, our high fat fed pups coming from our high fat fed gestational diabetic dams have a significantly higher ratio. Moving over to the heart triglyceride concentration, uh, our high fat fed uh, litters from our high fat fed gestational diabetic mothers have a significantly higher heart triglyceride concentration than did our low fat controls. So moving on to some conclusions, um, we're noting that the consumption of our high fat and sucrose diets by our pregnant uh, dams is leading to the development of hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, and glucose intolerance, characteristic of gestational diabetes. We noticed that our gestational diabetes is increasing the susceptibility of our rat offspring to cardiac hypertrophy. Um, these findings have important implications since gestational diabetes may be an important factor that contributes to the development of uh, diabetic cardiomyopathy later in life. Um, our increased cardiac levels of triglycerides could be involved in this phenomenon. The relevance is that this animal model is, uh, is clinically relevant, mimicking the human gestational diabetic condition and will be important in defining mechanisms and testing therapies for gestational diabetes and the prenatal causes of cardi uh, cardiac hypertrophy and the development of diabetic cardiomyopathy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Rempel. I'm in my second month of my master's degree program. <laughs> Just to let you know. <laughs> um, so I would say physical activity we know is important for health in general, it, particularly cardiovascular and metabolic health. When looking at individuals with type 2 diabetes, there's a lot of research looking at the effects of how exercise can improve uh, their metabolic control in terms of their uh, blood glucose control. However, there's not a lot of studies looking at the effects of exercise as it relates to the metabolic control in individuals with type 1 diabetes. 
Despite the fact that there is benefits with exercise, individuals with type 1 diabetes tend to have a fear associated with exercise because they can develop post-exercise or exercise-related hypoglycemia. In order to address this gap in research, we conducted a systematic review which is considered to give the highest strength of evidence in a particular area, and we also conducted a meta-analysis within that, and we tested the hypothesis. Exercise will lower hemoglobin A1c in individuals with type 1 diabetes if the appropriate frequency, at least twice weekly, and duration of greater than eight weeks is utilized. So as mentioned, our study design was a systematic review, and we searched through all the major databases and looked for key terms, diabetes, exercise, and physical activity, and we had 11,773 abstracts. After that, we, um, we did our, our inclusion criteria, which is the participants had to be individuals with type 1 diabetes, the inter intervention was physical activity of any kind, it had to be a randomized controlled trial, both supervised and unsupervised physical activity, individuals of any age, our comparison group was looking at exercise versus non-exercise groups, our primary outcome measure was hemoglobin A1C or glycated hemoglobin, and our time frame was greater than eight weeks in duration and at least twice weekly, and that gave us 49 abstracts. After that, we did secondary screening where we made sure that these articles were truly randomized and we, they had extractable data, and six out of the 49 articles met the, that criteria. However, four out of the six articles used hemoglobin A1C as a primary outcome measure, which is what I will show you. These are the results of our meta-analysis. So these are forest plots, and the, the diamonds represent the pooled data from all the different all the different studies and the boxes represent the diff mean difference in the different studies. So you can see that in our primary outcome measure, glycated hemoglobin, there was a significant effect and it favored the exercise group, meaning that exercise did lower hemoglobin A1C. Two of our secondary outcome measures were insulin dose and you would hope that with exercise, individuals can lower their insulin dose. And um, in terms of maximal oxygen uptake, it did favor the exercise group again and they did increase their maximal oxygen uptake. When you look at our review compared to other reviews, although we had very conservative inclusion criteria, we had very similar effect sizes, which addresses the need for a future study. So in the future, we plan to conduct both an acute and a randomized control trial. The acute trial will serve as my thesis project, where we will look at the acute effects of exercise on hemoglobin A1C and blood glucose control, and we'll also conduct a randomized control trial through the different YMCAs throughout Winnipeg. We have two primary objectives. The first objective is at what intensity will we reduce uh, the chance of developing post-exercise hypoglycemia and at what intensity will we have sufficient release of counter-regulatory hormones in order to increase hepatic glucose output. The implications of our research is that we hope that we can disseminate this knowledge to the community so that individuals with type 1 diabetes don't have to be fearful about exercise and they can still incorporate it into their other everyday life and we hope to give this information to different um, clinics around Winnipeg such as the Durka Clinic and the Uville Clinic, and to educate diabetes educators, nurses, doctors, certified exercise physiologists, so that they can talk with their clients about how to keep exercise in their life. I would like to thank uh, the University of Manitoba, who has supplied me funding through the Graduate Student Fellowship, and I'd like to thank my supervisor, Dr. John McGavick, for allowing me to be his master's student, and for all my colleagues who have welcomed me and helped me along in this process. Thanks very much again to our uh, second group of presenters for a really, really terrific uh, series of presentations on diabetes. Again, I'd like to open the floor first to our judges, please. This is not neither, sorry. Um, so you started out with 11,000 articles and whittled it down to 49. Can you tell me how you did that? Because that's a lot of articles. Even with your inclusion criteria, did you read them all? Hello? Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I personally did not read through all 11,000, but it was the, the abstract was given, and then you would quickly look, okay, if it's type 2 diabetes, excluded. If it's not a randomized control trial, you exclude it. And they had a spreadsheet where they would kind of scroll down and go exclude, include, unsure, 
and they would kind of go through it, and two of them did it, Jane and one of, another person in our lab did it. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. I, I can imagine. <laughs> so that was great. Uh, um, Caitlin, um, I love your study. I've seen a bit of it through Liz as well, some of those results, and I think they're really interesting. Uh, I'm curious if you can step back a bit, and I may have missed this in your introduction. Uh, I know at this stage you're only looking at Aboriginal peoples. Uh, is there a chance that this same uh, mutation is, or I don't know, mutation is the right word, genotype is, or is uh, also in non-Aboriginal peoples? Um, it's never been found in non-Aboriginal people, and um, it's been found to be a unique and private polymorphism, so okay. um, just in the OG Cree population. Okay. So then my follow-up question to this is more around knowledge translation. Um, and so who have you had involved in your team from the Aboriginal community, given we understand that uh, we're learning more about how we use data and represent data in that field? Okay. Um, well, Dr. Heather Dean and the, um, all of the doctors and individuals that work at the DERCA work closely with um, the Aboriginal community. I wasn't personally involved in much of that, but they, I know they have a DOHAD steering committee. I attended one of those meetings, but um, I wasn't involved with that, but they do work closely with the so community. So when you, in, you attended that meeting, yes. what did you notice about the importance of having that steering, those people at the, your steering committee? Um, I think it's important to... Uh, keep a perspective of the individuals that you're working with and how these studies can affect the population. And um, yeah, I think it just keeps you focused on why it is that we're looking at all this, these long lists of data and um, yeah, the effect that it can have for the community. I have a question for Jane about the uh, exercise study. Uh, one of the things you were looking at was sort of uh, maximum performance in an exercise task. I was wondering how you... Uh, arrange the motivation? In other words, what were the instructions that the people had in terms of getting to that maximal exercise point? Okay, well, first of all, I'm going to say something that I forgot to say when I got to the podium there, and that's, I'm Jane Yardley, and I'm in Dr. McGavick's lab. Uh, second of all, that was a, a secondary data analysis. I wasn't actually the person collecting the data on the maximum uh, capacity tests. However, I have done many of them in the past. Uh, for the most part, we are just constantly encouraging them and pushing them because we can usually tell from listening to their breathing, from seeing their physical cues, whether or not they're close to that maximum. And we're also watching the values on the screen. So we've got physiological data showing us whether they're close to that maximum. It's a little bit different doing it with a teenage population who's sedentary because they may think they're close to their maximum when they're not. And uh, in talking to the people who did the study, um, they were saying that it was all about volume. Mm -hmm. um, just very loud encouragement, very constant encouragement, and uh, telling them what a great job they're doing, and just keep pushing until you can't push anymore. Good, good. Just one more question to follow up to that. Uh, if there's different evaluators involved, anything you do with the team to standardize that between different people? I could imagine different people express, you know, different uh, evaluators might express their encouragement differently, that sort of thing. Just any thought about that? No, I guess I hadn't really thought about that. And I, I suppose it's because most of us really do it the same way for the most part because we know how we would like to be encouraged. Um, and I mean, we've done this as a team with, uh, with the Winnipeg Jets, for example. We did some testing for their, their training camps. And it was interesting to see there were four of us there from different backgrounds and we're using a lot of the same vocabulary and we're using a lot of the same expressions. And it just seems to, you know, keep it up. You're doing great. Keep going. Good work. Come on. You can, keep, you can do this. It, we all were using a lot of the same expressions. So in terms of standardizing, I, I think it's, um, it's pretty standard already. Good. <laughs> Thank you. So, so Troy, I know that your mouse model is going to be uh, really important as you move further in understanding the changes in the uh, GDM model. I was curious because I th I'm wondering, is is the research already out there that shows this link within humans yet? And you're sort of stepping back to sort of say, why is that link happening? Or are you the first to suggest this link as well between GDM mothers and uh, cardi in early uh, onset cardiac hypertrophy? Well, I think most of the research has been done with youth onset type 2 diabetes so far. Um, I haven't read many articles on human studies. It's mostly been animal studies of cardiac hypertrophy in the case of adolescent 
forms of it. Mm -hmm. um, all I know is our model is, it's strange, but our model with diet induced ge uh, gestational diabetes is actually rare. It's our first, uh, <laughs> we're really the first ones to look at how the postnatal diet is affecting the offspring mm -hmm. coming from a clinically relevant model that's not. So I think it, you, you could be doing some interesting observational trials already in the clinical side as well, and I just think it's really neat right. if that's not already out there. Thanks. Troy, can I ask you a quick question? Um, this was a huge crash course in me in animal research because, right. you know, I deal with a child and their parent. Um, and I know when I develop a, a study, um, in the study type I decide to use, so whether it's cross-sectional or longitudinal or prospective or whatever, I know the limitations based on the study design that I choose. Um, based on the study design that you have, can you tell me what some of the limitations are of the research that you have just presented? Um, limitations in terms of different between the rats and the humans. Obviously, the gestational period itself is really small. It's 21 days compared to nine months in a mother. And if we're trying to implement therapies in order to try to target during the gestational period of the mother itself, if we're thinking that it's an epigenetic change, that period of treatment in an animal is only seven days because that's like gestational diabetes is diagnosed in the third trimester. So that last seven days is a limitation the number of offspring, uh, plantation sites, everything like there's uh, uh, different. There's limitations. Uh, also, we've had limitations with the actual pregnancy, like the, the gestational days. We don't have an ultrasound. We've, we're getting an ultrasound, so we're basically looking for the plugs and we're doing swabs to have exact dates. So when I say mid gestation, for example, that's roughly the 14th day, because we're not 100% sure, but those are some of the limitations. Thanks. We've uh, got a few minutes for, if there are any questions from the audience, please. Yeah, Dr. Dean. I have a teacher voice, is that okay? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, I have a question for Megan. Um, in our clinic of 550 kids with type 1 diabetes, we have everything from a couch potato to very highly competitive um, athletes on AAA hockey teams that belong to the Western Hockey League. Um, in the meta-analysis and the systematic review, how did people control for baseline fitness and exercise level in terms of the impact of exercise on A1C? Well, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> I have to say, I, I'm not really sure on that one. They're not all couch potatoes. They're not all fearful. Yeah, exactly. That's the beauty of a randomized trial. You don't have to control. <laughs> um, any other questions from the audience? No? Yeah. Seeing nobody's running to the microphone, I would like to thank um, our presenters from the second theme, and uh, join if you can join me in th uh, congratulating them again. And our last theme this afternoon is on the brain. And I, at the beginning, I told you that there were 10 presenters. We've heard from nine. So the third theme, there is only one speaker. And I would like to invite her, please, to the lectern. Hi, my name is Ravinder, and I'm doing my PhD in Dr. Tamara Ogovi lab. And I'm actually mainly focused to study the function of OTX2 in human neurodevelopment as well as in medulloblastoma progression using the neural, uh, neural precursor cell. So medulloblastoma actually is a highly aggressive and heterogeneous uh, pediatric brain tumor which arises in the cerebellum under the age of, uh, in the children under the age of five. So recently by Michael Taylor group, so uh, medulloblastoma has been classified into four molecular variant, wind, sonic hedgehog, group three, and group four. So group three and group four, they are highly aggressive with OTX2 amplification and overexpression. So an OTX2 is a transcription factor which is highly important in the early uh, brain development. As you can see in this picture, that in the absence of OTX2, it, it developed into a headless phenotype. And however, its role in medulloblastoma development, it's highly conflicting in literature as tum oncogenic versus tumor suppressive. So to better understand its role, we use the uh, uh, 
cellular system that is neural precursor derived from human embryonic stem cell. So we have both normal as well as neo precursor cells. So neo neoplastic neural precursor cells. So they have the features of pediatric brain tumor and OTX2 overexpression. So we can use this model system along with the medulloblastoma cell line to study the gain and loss of function of OTX2. And for that. Uh, when we overexpress OTX2 in no normal neur uh, neural precursor cells and Doi cell line, as we validated with the Western blot, the overexpression, and the stable overexpressed cells, they were further tested for cellular function, and we see a huge uh, a drop in the self renewal as assessed by neural neurosphere assay and cell proliferation and in cell migration. Uh, properties of these cells in both cell line independently. And also in the DOI cells, the OTX2 overexpressed cells showed a dramatic decrease in this uh, tumor formation compared to the no, uh, control cells. And our uh, global gene expression changes also support our cell functional changes. That also shows a drop in the stem cell gene, as you can see here, and also uh, a drop in the uh, uh, genes that uh, are related to cell proliferation and cell migration gene. And on the other hand, by uh, when we uh, knock down this gene in the neuro neoplastic neural precursor and D283 cells, <coughs> so we also find a drop in cumulative cell count. And this study is still in progress. So from from this, we can conclude that neural precursor, normal, and neoplastic, they provide an alternative model system to study the gene function related to pediatric brain tumor. And from our OTX2 data, we can conclude that OTX2 has a cell state dependent tumor, uh, uh, tumor suppressive versus oncogenic role depend on the cells where it expressed, which we will explore in more detail by studying the downstream uh, pathways or genes that are affected by OTX2 overexpression as well as its knockdown. So how this uh, knowledge will translate uh, into uh, screening the therapeutic targets for the medulloblastoma tumor. So having the normal counterpart and the tumor cell lines, so this will provide us an opportunity to screen the uh, novel therapeutic um, uh, molecule. So as you can see in this model, so the normal cells, they have normal self-renewal capacity and differentiation, which having, uh, when they uh, transform and acquire high self-renewal, so they can develop tumor. But we have this opportunity to screen the small molecule that is uh, peptide or RNAi, and we can differentially choose the molecules that differentially affect the tumor cells by keeping the normal cells intact. And by further in vitro uh, studies on the cell functional changes and also in vivo tumorigenic potential, we can select those molecules which suppress the self renewal capacity of tumor cells and differentiate them to more uh, uh, and differentiate them to more mature cell, uh, cell type. So this will help us to develop the safe and novel therapeutic agent to cure the children having uh, medulloblastoma without and minimize that those treatment related deficits. Thank you. Thanks very much. We have uh, about uh, five or six minutes for questions and I'll begin again please with the judges. I want to thank you for a, a very well done presentation. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, just putting this in a bigger perspective, uh, first of all, it's very helpful to have a model like this for, for research. What are some of the cha challenges you see in going from a, uh, in the lab and in the Petri dish model to uh, actual tumors in real life? What are some of the challenges you'll have to be aware of as you work on that research? By having this uh, cell system, so it will help us to uh, just to do more laborious work, such as like to screen uh, the genotransplantation. So that's the opportunity that we um, can. But there are challenges, um, such as like um, we have we cannot like just select a molecules and implicate that into uh, to the human system. So we have to go through like the mouse system and then first and then see like if that is. Uh, 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 we can like uh, just kill the uh, tumor cells in mouse model, and then we can only. I think we have to go through a proper protocol to go to the human system. Yeah. Good, that's helpful. Uh, another question I have for you is, 
thinking of the, of the study that you've finished and presented here, uh, again, along the way, did you run into some challenges in doing the study and your procedures that you had to overcome the challenges before you were able to finish the study? Yeah, because uh, uh, actually it's very challenging to work with uh, these uh, human embryonic stem cell because they are very sensitive. So as we have to use like the, uh, uh, they are very sensitive to antibiotic and they are very sensitive to density. They are density dependent because when I see like when I culture them in low density, so they tend to differentiate. So those are the challenges that you have really need to like develop and like practice or like have proper handling techniques like to work with these cells. So that's the, but the same way because we are using the uh, tumor cell lines, so which provide us an opportunity because at some point if we are not able to get enough cells, so we can always supplement uh, with the uh, like tumor cell lines to, to do, do more like molecular experiments. So that's why we are using the like these uh, tumor cell lines as well. Oh, I can ask one question. Um, in your data analysis, you talked a lot about the, sort of your background. In the analysis that you did, did you find the uh, what you found was it in the direction that you expected it to be in? So compared to what you've already read um, in the past about this type of research. Was this what you expected to find? And if so, can you tell me what the link is between previous research and what you found? Uh, in relation to OTX2 function mm -hmm. in tumor? So yes, yeah, because we hypothesis, uh, hypo hypothesis size based on the previous literature that OTX2 might have tumor suppressive uh -huh. and oncogenic function. It depends on the cell, uh, state of the cell because there are studies like where they related that OTX2 is important in the gonadotrophin neuro neurons like hormones and other hormones. So it means like it depends like where it is expressing and it have a very temporal and spatial regulation during the development. So, and there is also a study where they show like OTX2 suppress the stem cell genes and promote the differentiation. So that is the direction because we also see that the OTX2 in our system also in both cell line, it suppressed the stem cell gene and promote the differentiation. So what we will like study that how OTX2 interact with those stem cell gene to regulate their expression. And we are kind of expecting the same because in the dye cell line, which where OTX2 is not expressed, we see that by overexpressing, we are promoting differentiation. And in the D2A3 cell, which already have OTX2 expression, and when we knocked it down, we are also seeing the uh, uh, drop in the cell number. So which is kind of like that we are getting the same thing, uh -huh. tumor suppressive versus oncogenic function. So you're supportive of previous yes. literature. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I want to just also say I think it's courageous because you're sitting up there all by yourself and the other cohort had, had <laughs> yeah. numbers. There was like um, safety and <laughs> numbers. So that was, that was my question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks very much. Um, we have um, one minute if there are any questions from the audience. Again, I'd like to uh, echo uh, Dr. Jones's comments. It does take a lot of courage to sit up here by yourself, so thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all of our presenters today. That was really terrific. It's so exciting to hear about all of the work that you're doing. I've been away from Manitoba now for about two years, and a lot of things have, have changed, um, and certainly for the better. It's delightful to see so many different projects going on, um, and a warm congratulations to all of you for being the top 10 abstract presenters. Um, with that said, I'd like to bring the Dr. Goodbear Den uh, to a close, and I'll turn the floor over now to Dr. Claussen for a few uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Well, I don't have a lot to say, but I want to congratulate each and every one of you. It takes uh, a lot of courage. Although what I took from Dr. Walker's talk uh, today is that adversity brings it resilience. So I just feel the resilience quotient in this room just has increased dramatically. Uh, so congratulations to each of you. And to the judges, I, I think your task is pretty tough, but we've certainly put it in good hands. I was totally impressed. I could not tell the areas of your research. You were able to really ask some probing questions, and um, so I was quite impressed by uh, that ability to do that. So uh, thanks to each and every one of you. 
and um, thanks to the audience. Uh, wow, we've really maintained a good, a good number of people. That's great to see. I think it's to the quality of presentations. Um, I've been asked by Adrian Aline to remind you, if you have a poster up, please take it down, because I think if you don't, it goes to the poster Never Never Land. So if you want to bond with your poster and keep it there, uh, please remove it. Um, other than that, I think you need to have a little break, dress up if you want, and we'll reconvene at 6.30 p.m at the Assiniboine Park at the Qualico Family Center, and we're going to party. We're going to have a few people say a few words. We have an absolutely dynamite uh, speaker, Michael Redhead Champagne. Um, you know, how many people actually have a, a TED Talk on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the web uh, before they give a speech? Um, it's almost become mandatory, it seemed like. Last year's Mitch uh, speaker also had that. Um, and um, we have a great dinner and just, you know, with great people. So uh, we'll see you there and uh, drive safely and um, take a little break and rest. So thank you, everybody. And thanks to uh, Jen Protager for coming and uh, doing such a great job with Dog Good Bears Den. <laughs>